Hello, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Silvana Rodriguez, and I'm a senior digital fellow at New America, which is a think tank based in Washington, DC. Since we are having some issues today, this is a pre-recorded conversation, and we're looking forward to sharing this with you. So yesterday, the Summit for Democracy kicked off in Seoul, and a major focus was the role of technology. And one of the biggest takeaways is that we all need to come together to build a tech future that is inclusive, rights respecting, and drives progress for everybody. So fittingly, today we have a great group of panelists who are coming together to explore how democracies can harness digital tools to nurture resilience and trust in government. Now to set the scene, this landscape is not uh, a simple one. First of all, democracies are under pressure to show that they can deliver for the things that matter most for their people and their livelihoods in the face of rising alternatives. We're also seeing that tech offers some incredible tools to deliver progress, but it also brings some significant harms in certain situations. We also see that developments in the tech space are happening at a pace that governments are really struggling to keep up with. And finally, we are living in a very dynamic global context where we have some active conflict zones around the world. And this is also the biggest year for elections in world history with more than half of humanity going to the polls this year in nationwide votes. So this is complicated, but if we're in the interest of shoring up democracy for future generations, we're focused on trying to gather voices around the table that are committed to digital systems that work in the public interest. So our goal today is to spend this hour talking about some of the things we're optimistic about and some of the things that might help us get there. And our four panelists are bringing different perspectives from around the world. We have Laura Bingham, Professor of Practice and Inaugural Director of Temple University Institute for Law, Innovation and Technology. We have Mike Mora, Senior Specialist at the Organization of American States in the Department for Effective Public Management. We have Allison Price, who's the Senior Advisor at New America in the Digital Impact and Governance Initiative. And finally, Alec Tarkowski, Director of Strategy at Open Future. So let's uh, start by digging in with what we're seeing on the ground. So just to set the scene a little bit, these terms resilience and trust can sometimes be a little bit abstract. So help me paint this picture in very practical terms. What does it actually look like when democracies are successfully harnessing digital tools to nurture resilience and to earn the trust of the people they serve? Like, What is the end goal here? And this is for all panelists, please. I can jump in, Silvana, if, if, if I may, uh, very quick here. Um, on your point, I think it could be abstract, but at the same time, I think it's very practical. Citizens want to be practical as well. So easy transactions, less transactional costs, time and money, right? Openness and participation. I want to feel as a citizen. Uh, I want to feel that there is a protocol that applies to all without discretion. Citizens can schedule appointments to issue or renew passwords, for example, in some in some countries and have to pay a third party to jump the line to get that appointment. That is unacceptable these days. It has to get practical. We have to be able to translate it into, this into easy transaction and less transactional costs for the citizen. I think that that is key and it's practical. It's not abstract at the end. It's actually our daily life that's impacted by the decisions on how we go about in implementing digital government. Mm -hmm. I like to think that um, there's a role played by the government, but it's part of sort of a bigger picture. And at Open Future, the bigger picture for us is public sphere, in this case, a digital public sphere. So because I'm thinking in these terms shifts a bit the equation from conversations that we've been having say for 20, 30 years on digital government, which are still relevant. We still have goals to achieve. But if I think if we add this added perspective that we don't want just, um, as uh, Mike said, the efficient, fair government services, but we want them to contribute to a space that also feels like it's a space of truth and not disinformation, um, a space where basically civil values are respected. Um, I think that's for me an important context here as well. Yeah, and uh, maybe just piggybacking off of that, I think another key component that we really focus on at uh, ILIT, the institute um, that I work with is equity and sort of re and recognizing um, that there is just not going to be one size fits all implementation, you know? And I, I think that's where um, the building trust 
um, really is absolutely fundamental, um, demonstrating through the implementation and use and design of the, the tools that we're talking about that have so much potential that there's a, there is a, you know, sort of fulsome recognition that actualizing those tools in people's lives is going to take different measures of investment and starting with the hardest investments where to the, with the communities that have that, that, you know, these advantages simply have not reached and actually more of the harms have, are, will resonate there. That's where the investment needs to go first. Mm -hmm. if, if I can jump in, I always use jargon, so uh, forgive me, but the way I like to explain it, yes, to what everybody just said, but I really wish that we could create a digital ecosystem where customer service and user experience were not second thoughts. Like so much of these tech solutions that are being used in the public realm, it's like, well, how is this helping the government? And that is really, really important. But also asking simultaneously, how is this helping communities and people? That boils down to making sure that customer service and user experience aren't second thoughts, that they are at the table from the forefront. Okay. So that gives us sort of a, a picture in our mind of what we're aiming for, this end goal we want. Easy transactions, less cost and time, practical, equity being important, uh, being contributing to a space of truth and a situation where customer service and digital experiences are all priority. So now that we have that vision, let's start with Mike for some insight from Latin America. And I'm curious what you think is applicable beyond the region. So drawing from your experience at the OAS, how can a digital government initiative improve transparency and accountability? What's maybe a successful approach or example that you've seen that sort of illustrates that for us? Thank you, Silvana. Allow me to uh, begin by um, stating that in OAS terms, uh, as per the Inter-American Democratic Charter, uh, effective and transparent public management is fundamental component for the exercise of democracy. And that's that's key uh, for us. Having said that, a digital government initiative can only be in can only improve transparency and accountability if it's meant to do that. It has to be intentional. At the Department for Effective Quality Management, we have uh, working during the last decade in advancing open data greatly along that for uh, transparency and, 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 um, and accountability. Uh, and we believe government openness, participation, and use of government data is key is a key ingredient. Now, uh, that is core of our agenda, among other things that we worked on uh, digital government and open government here at the department. So, but open data is key. Data is key, and not only for uh, transparency and accountability now, but actually it's key for the use of emerging and new technologies who need quality data to run on. And I think that's gonna be then part of the conversation that we're gonna have. But in, in, in making data core uh, in our work, I wanna highlight a few things that I think are very important. In 2018, uh, the presidents of this hemisphere uh, at the Summit of the Americas agreed uh, to launch an inter-American program in open data to prevent and combat corruption. Again, we have to be intentional. And I think that is very important. Big first agreement in open data and is in the region, and specifically it was to prevent and combat corruption. I think that's telling us something very important here. And I think this is one of the things that can be translated in other regions, you know, as, as I've been across, right? Are there regional agreements to use open data or digital government to uh, for more transparency uh, in public administration? So in 2018, presidents came together. Uh, we charge at, at our department to um, to to help uh, member states uh, to improve the implementation of open data to prevent and combat corruption. Now, Colombia is a good example. If you go to the national open data open data portal, uh, you'll find that. PETA is there. The, I'm going to say PETA because this is the short name for Inter-American Open Data Program to Prevent and Combat Corruption. But it's a good example. You go there and you have 30 priority data sets to prevent and combat corruption, including public procurement. So I think uh, all this packaging, it's, it's very important. It's intentional. You create policies, commitments, and you have to make sure that 
um, you 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 can actually impact uh, the fight against corruption with this. I'm traveling tomorrow to the Dominican Republic to initiate implementation of this program there. So countries are are doing it. Now, the last summit of the Americas in 2022, now I talked about 2018, 2022 now, in Los Angeles also resulted in commitments on digital transformation that I think that are important to highlight. And I quote uh, from those commitments, I continue to promote the use and leverage of information and communication technologies with digitalization of public service delivery to strengthen transparency, improve efficiency and accountability, and so on and so forth. Some of the Americas have actually come up with key commitments and presidents are working on that. And then the ministers of foreign affairs are acting on it. So, but open data doesn't happen spontaneously. Uh, to take advantage of open data, you need to have data infrastructure in place in, uh, in place um, that positions you to do that. That is a directive, right? A political buy-in, policies, human capital, IT capabilities, and uh it fits at the national level interoperability as well. So here we're talking about digital transformation and data is at the core for interoperability as well. And you need to have a society that uses um, for that purpose. But also let me point out that the region, um, the uh, and the OEA is working more than, it's more like Latin America. We, we kind of always say Latin America, but includes independent con all in countries in the hemisphere, right? The Americas from Canada, the United States to uh, the very own Haiti right now to all the Caribbean, all the way in south to, to Argentina. And I wanted to highlight this because we are a very diverse region in terms of digital government readiness. And that poses challenges as a region. Uh, think about immigration, uh, just to correlate, right? People leave their countries for the lack of opportunities. Well. It is not different uh, when it comes to digital government readiness. And therefore, public administrations are struggling to deliver services efficiently and transparent, and that hurts democracy. So I think i leave it there, uh, Silvana, right now with that quick uh, run, but definitely for us at the OAS, data is key. Open data and data, uh, good quality data can be utilized uh, with emerging technologies uh, for the benefit of democracy. Thank you, Mike. And I think that helps us flow into a, a question that I have for Laura specifically, which is that last week, the World Bank launched a major report highlighting two emerging trends that are transforming our digital future. So the first one is digital public infrastructure, which I might refer to as DPI from now on, um, and artificial intelligence. Both are huge topics. So let's start with DPI. How do you see digital public infrastructure being unique from other digital government approaches that we've heard about until now or that we've been using until now? Okay, um, thanks. So I, uh, let's see. Well, first of all, a caveat that I think that a lot of what I'm gonna describe and uh, DPI in general, you know, when it comes to the definition itself, um, you're basically, when you're asked this question, you're sure to leave everyone unsatisfied and probably offend a couple of people along the way. Um, so, uh, but I, I do think honestly, it captures a lot of what Mike was just saying. Um, and and some of it, it, there, there, are, there are parts of this discussion that just simply won't sound new. Um, so I don't think anyone should, should walk away from DPI because it's an acronym and, you know, uh, and, and it sounds new, but, um, but basically, I think just unpacking some of the terms, infrastructure, right? Digital public infrastructure. So the idea behind that um, within this um, discourse is really that there are certain things that are foundational that ought to be operating that are digital and foundational. So there's an analogy that's often invoked to roads or, or highways or railroads, right? That are physical infrastructures. But in this case, we're, ta we're still talking about something that's almost not really even experienced in daily life, that it's so sort of foundational uh, that it's operating in the background somehow, right? Um, so that's that's an element of thinking about um, some of the things that need to get set down in order to allow digital government to operate in some of the ways that Mike was talking about. Um, and those generally have, that's generally included three components that are commonly referenced in definitions of digital public infrastructure. So it includes digital identity, the ability to prove you are who you say you are in online transactions, 
a digital payments infrastructure um, and data exchange, which I think was uh, what, what one thing that Mike was referencing with interoperability, right? The, the idea that, um, and, and the level of openness, I think is something that is uh, still under um, debate, to be honest, to go back to some of the principles that we started with, you know, to be frank and honest, <laughs> um, that's the way I see it. But I think that one key ambition that's captured in the DPI conversation is that is this society-wide scale. Um, and that at the end of the day, what's the, the vision um, is that, uh, you know, on top of those layers, the digital identity, digital payments, data exchange um, architectures, that there'll be this innovative ecosystem that includes public sector service delivery on the basis of, you know, open data, access to, to the data exchange in those foundational layers and um, pri and also private sector innovation and private sector services. Um, and that this would all be done, you know, safely and mitigating for all the harms in, in, that anyone can think about in all the things that I just described. And I think, you know, maybe the, the la last piece of the data exchange and sort of in an innovation economy on top of that is where DPI actually, this vision that I'm describing really intersects with the second piece that you named, which is artificial intelligence. So I think it's it's a little bit illusory to try to separate these things because the idea of, of you know integrating emerging technologies is fundamental to, to the, the vision of, of digital public infrastructure as a foundation for digital government and digital economies. Um, and you know, I think maybe the last piece that I'll say here is the the questions that emerge about, um, you know, different models, like in Estonia, for instance, uh, the data exchange architecture called XROAD um, is something that has, you know, had a lot of influence um, outside of the borders of Estonia. And so the idea that any one kind of model of DPI can be kind of exported to other countries or, or integrated in some way and on a regional level also, just going back to Mike's comments, um, I think is something that requires more dialogue, you know, uh, to the extent to which that is um, of value and which components and, you know, sort of how different countries can adapt to different models because societies are all so different. Um, so that's part of the thesis. But I think it's it's an area where we still need a lot more unpacking and discussion. To pull a little bit at one of the threads you mentioned, which is really about mitigating some of the harms that could come about even inadvertently when you're using one of these approaches. How do you think you can mitigate um, concerns like uh, you know inadvertently harming democratic processes or in, a, in a, or uh, things like societal values when you're using a DPI framework at mm -hmm. the outset? Yeah. So I think, I mean, that's when we get to um, the middle word in the public, right? What does that mean? Um, and I think Alec was also talking, uh, speaking to this in, in the beginning um, and it probably has a lot more to say on this, but uh, for me, I think naming what those potential harms are is also unfinished work. Um, I, I think, and that's where those different components that I, set out, uh, especially, so most of my work has been on digital identity. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think, it, you know, that when you start to talk about risks and mitigations, it's really hard to be up at this level of DPI. I think you, you really actually have to drill down much deeper into the foundational aspects and other aspects that are implicated, you know, and there, for instance, so um, digital identity, uh, 180 countries, roughly, in the world have centralized national ID systems already. Those are the systems that determine citizenship: who is it, who's in, and who's out. Um, and you know, I, I think that is we're now starting from scratch. There's a lot of discrimination. The systems are discriminatory by nature um, because they have to decide who is a citizen and who isn't. But they're also discriminatory in practice in a lot of different ways. There are 25 countries that have open, openly directly discriminatory laws that don't allow women to pass citizenship to their children and spouses, you know? Um, so if, if the digital identity system is simply kind of inaugurating in a digital way, those national identity systems, people are gonna get 
really harmed by it and democracy and and you know they won't whatever the intention might be they won't be included along this digital highway and that is a problem for democracy it's a problem for corruption it's a, you know it sort of it, it impacts the institutions that we're here to talk mm -hmm. about and so i mean one of the big things that i always try and bring the discussion to even just on digital identity is fixing the laws that we have that are implicated and sort of and that that's just one layer you know talking about nationality laws civil registration you know that aspect but um i think there there's a whole other set of concerns that we'll probably get into more around um privacy and um the the way that these system, that digital systems can concentrate power within executive agencies and you know whether the administrative laws are really up to snuff to um, figure out how to use that power and what are some of the sort of checks and balances that can be in place that maybe are in place but need to be strengthened. Um, so let me let me stop there. And that's really helpful. And maybe we can drill down into some of these topics that you've laid out by asking Allison uh, to talk a little bit about an example of DPI that you looked at recently in Ukraine. So we're talking about a crisis context. Um, and I believe you recently wrote a report about Ukraine's e-recovery program. So can you tell us a little bit more sort of building off of the, the vision now that Laura's given us, drill down into how Ukraine is approaching some of these issues and, and also how this program might be doing sort of the, the big picture stuff we're talking about, which is really nurturing resilience and nurturing trust in government. I, I will try. <laughs> DPI, which I think Laura just experienced, cannot be boiled down to a bumper sticker. I have tried like in every way possible about how to minimize um, the descriptions of it just because it, it covers a lot. Um, but Digi, our team at New America, we collaborated with the future of land and housing team to take a closer look at the e-recovery program in Ukraine, which right now is basically using an app, DIA, to get Ukrainians back into their homes during, um, you know, wartime. Um, the reason we were interested in studying this is because it's the first, ex first ever example of a government compensation program um, for damaged or destroyed homes uh, that was rolled out digitally at scale during a crisis. And why is this important? Well, not only is it countering Russian aggression, which leads to resilience of communities, it's also a speedier approach to the provision of public services. Um, we specifically looked at five innovations. I don't want to go super deep on the tech because I'd rather talk about the implications of the tech. DIA, Ukraine, it's all still early days. They are still at war. There's lots of things that we could critique that is unresolved about public policy, legal questions, tech and governance questions, and those are important, and we should be spending time on them for a healthier reconstruction process when we get to the reconstruction process. But I think right now, DIA is a great example of innovations that touch on, as Laura said, ID verification payments and uh, you know data exchange. So in the case of e-recovery, claimants, so Ukrainians, can file from anywhere, anytime. Um, they can go and use the e-recovery portal through the DIA app to, to reduce the risk of even um, you know, going to government offices or intake centers in the midst of a war zone. Uh, it's relying on a digital first process, uh, emphasis on digital first, not digital only, which we think really allows governments to quickly be responsive um, to the needs of the people. So if you are a digital first process, you can quickly modify an app in response to concerns, legislative progress, reforms, changing realities on the ground. Um, we're interested in DIA because DIA is a pre-existing platform in Ukraine that existed before the war and then has quickly changed and morphed in responsive to the points um, in point two that, you know, there's a baked in understanding and recognition that the systems work from the millions of Ukrainians who are using it. Um, and there's trust in other transactions. It's not like Ukrainians are like, okay, recovery is the only solution that's being used through these DIA rails. Um, the fourth innovation we're really looking at is how, and this impacts all countries, but if managed effectively, we think digital first 
processes minimize opportunities for corruption. Mike was talking about corruption, and it's something I think all governments are spending a lot of time trying to figure out where digital fits in their anti-corruption measures. And it also increases transparency to how claims are processed. So in real time, the government can sit there and say, we have given out this much money, we have processed this many claims, and what would be ideal in the next iteration of these solutions where that, avail that, that data is also available to the users in real time. Um, and, and the fifth point on e-recovery and why we really are um, taking a closer look at it is that it, during a conflict, whether it's man-made or whether it is a natural disaster, getting people back into the home, their homes takes a ton of effort. It takes resources. There's there's friction. Many times in war zones, people take over others' houses. It's complicated. Records are destroyed, all these things. But what we see going on in Ukraine right now is that they're proactively and responsively adjudicating claims. They're collecting evidence before the risk that you know property is taken over or lost or destroyed to someone else. Um, and we're, we're hopeful that it results in less abandoned homes that are occupied by not the rightful owners. And I think these are all interesting lessons that whether it's used for this specific purpose or another, other countries could be watching closely at this time. Sorry, I, I can talk about d &E recovery forever. So I hope that was short enough as to why we're excited about it right it's now. Wonderful, because I'm hearing a lot about the infrastructural approach, a lot about trust. And, uh, and you alluded to this a little bit at the end of what you were saying, um, and you're getting at my next question, which is whether these lessons could be applicable beyond a crisis context. For example, yeah, you know, in this question, I'm going to throw it to any panelist um, who'd like to opine, but could you see a DPI approach being used beyond a crisis context and being used in large advanced economies, for example, like in the United States, just to be a little bit provocative? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so this is a question... So a year ago in DC, there was this day called Dia Day. I, the, the branding's great. Um, and Kara Swisher, who's a, a well-known uh, journalist on the tech front, led a conversation about Dia um, with the Ukrainians and with uh, Samantha Power, Administrator Power with USAID. And she's like, well, this won't happen in the US, obviously. And, and the obviously part is what I think I really want to dig in on. I mean, the United States doesn't have a national privacy bill for like just base layer example of like why some of these solutions could be a problem in a place like the United States. But I don't think that that unresolved, you know, tech legal policy issues are unresolved. They need to be resolved. And then I think we can talk about how you can harness tech for the public good. But in the absence of those things existing, it gets very difficult very quickly. I think, again, DIA was built before the war and has been adapted during the war. And I think um, a lot of the speed and the resilience of which Ukraine has showed is because it's at wartime. But that doesn't mean that these solutions are for wartime only. I think, you know, what is working is the immediacy of it and the readiness and readiness to innovate and i don't believe ukraine is the only country in this world that has a readiness to innovate for the public mm -hmm. laura do you have any thoughts on that or maybe alex i have a lot of thoughts <laughs> maybe i'll just share you uh, <laughs> and we can circle back around but no i mean i think like the question about the us you know i i completely agree with what allison said i, I think what's being demonstrated is that the US is in catch up mode. And I think actually it's really good to recognize that. And I, I, what I don't wanna see happen in the US is that um, there's sort of an exceptionalism, you know, kind of turning inward mm -hmm. uh, and, and rather that, and, and I think that's an issue for, for DPI being uh, sort of, you know, the case being made as this is just this package deal and mm -hmm. like you have to take it all in and, and, and it's monolithic, like I, I just, I think that there are pieces that the U.S. Um, can share that are important, especially on safeguards and what what we might do more of to shore up safeguards and contribute to that conversation. And looking at you know really innovative work on the technical level to to translate some of those potential gains. You know, so I I think there's a lot to do in the U.S., um, but we should do it. <laughs> I think that's the key message. So 
I'd like to share an example from Poland where I'm based which is a neighboring country to Ukraine. At the same time, we're obviously in a very different reality. There's no war happening in Poland, but we're at the forefront, on the other hand, of a massive disinformation campaign. We are a society that is required right now to very urgently and quickly militarize, not just with military hardware, but, you know, Ongoing in Poland right now are debates what it means to be a society, maybe not on the front line, but very close to it. But there are also interesting stories connected to DSO. I think we're quite by now advanced with DPIs. This is my, you cannot really see it. It's a blank. Okay, a bit. This is my ID, right? It's in the phone. It still feels a bit weird to show it to the policewoman on the street, but it can be done. Um, the fun fact is that actually it also works for Ukrainians. So very quickly a bridge was made. And I think that's a bit of a success story. Indeed, Laura, you mentioned, I think there are huge challenges with digital identity systems. For instance, in, in, in face of migration, the wartime migration from Ukraine, in, in many regards, we in Poland think it was a great success of our society, not just the government, but the society. But in this case, the digital technology seemed to work really well. So if you're a Ukrainian in Poland, first of all, you have a Polish ID number, which gives you a lot of benefits, for instance, health benefits and social security to some extent, at least. Um, but you can also basically benefit from the same um, digital ID system. I, I don't want to say that this is all very simple, but I think these stories show that it can be done. And I really like the uh, the study on the recovery platform because you show how it's resilient under these very specific conditions of a wartime society. But in some ways, you can see how they build resilience. Also, for instance, in the case of migration, there's right now a million Ukrainians that several percent of all Ukraine in Poland, several percent of the whole Ukrainian society and also have several percent contribution to the Polish society. We're both societies of around 40 million. That's a very significant group, especially since it's concentrated in major cities. So these tools were, were very important. But again, speaking in this broader context, I also want to add that part of it is PDI, DPIs, digital public infrastructures built by the government. But I like to think they can also be civic. So for example, we had a really big program led by an initiative called Tech to the Rescue, which basically matched civil society organizations with tech companies. Both Poland, like Ukraine, we have a very big IT sector, a lot of software houses, really with a lot of capacity. And they would start building, in the end, often very basic tools, but tools that basically manage to deal with the really complicated um, you know, logistics of helping people. Um, so I think this is also this bigger context that um, we need to pay attention to. But the last thing I want to say, and I think while the story of, of tools like our Mobivatel platform and how it connects with DIA is sort of a history of good continuation. You know, we have a new government now, but some of these tools continue to be developed across sort of political divide. I think there's also need to build some new frameworks, new ways of thinking about things around these tools. And, and here I come back to this idea of sort of wartime societies. I think it's a big question, not just how our technologies are resilient. You know, these are the tra traditional cybersecurity issues. Our, Poland has spent a lot of time discussing our, our cloud platforms, government platforms secure. But I would like to it when I think of public space issues like is our information space secure? Um, I would even go so far as mention Wikipedia, which for me is a key civil project, probably not often considered, but it is a source of truth. How do we make that resilient? I would like to you know, develop further, and I think we're starting to do that right now in Poland, these sort of policy framings, value framings that can connect cybersecurity with issues like editing Wikipedia uh, in a way that sort of, again, preserves social resilience. So that that's very helpful because I am seeing how you're connecting some of what Poland has experienced, massive changes happening right after the last eight years, um, and how we can how the rest you know other democracies can draw from Poland's experience. And so, you know, we we've gotten at this in a, a couple different ways over the last thirty minutes or so. But I wanted to see if we could turn to the other big trend that's transforming our digital future, and that's the emergence of artificial intelligence or AI. So. How should democracies be approaching AI with this trust and this resilience in mind, knowing that different countries and different regions are going to handle tech issues quite differently? And I think we're seeing this play out 
even in the last few days with what's coming out of the European Union and the United States, et cetera. So throwing that question out there. If you, want, if you allow me, um, and I let um, Alec in, uh, who just uh, took the floor to rest a little bit. I want to highlight something, and probably a disclaimer, because my disclaimer is I'm a multilateral organization, right? So I see countries across the board, that package of 35 independent states here in the Americas. And as I pointed out, it's a very diverse region. And I think one of the things that is important uh, to have into consideration is what's something we're working on right now is to make sure that uh, there is a dialogue uh, among uh, countries that can uh, benefit the development of protocols, standards, agreements, um, in certainly artificial intelligence, as well as other uh, new emerging technology. And I, I think that's, that's very important. Why is it very important? Because countries are struggling to understand how to go about artificial intelligence. They don't have national artificial intelligence strategies, for example, or policies. You know, I'm talking about the countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, right? But there are many around the world that lack also that as well. So definitely finding a way to generate dialogue at the policy level um, that, that can come up with solutions, I think that's going to be very important. But here again, getting very practical, we cannot talk a lot about artificial intelligence if we don't have data governance. So data governance for us is key, very important. And if countries lack data governance, infrastructure, or ideas, strategies, policies, and so on, everything you build on top of that is going to be, again, maybe the trend. I put it, I conquer it as a government. I have a national AI strategy, uh, but it's meaningless, right? So I think that's that's so important to, to, to address here. So at the OAS, we're working right now with governments, with member states in developing the Inter-American Framework on Data Governance and Artificial Intelligence. So it's 90% of data governance and 10% of artificial intelligence. That's how I describe it pretty much. Um, and, and, and the reason why is because, it, I mean, we cannot engage so vividly in this discussion about artificial intelligence with the countries when the absence of preparation is 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 just real. It's not there. So I think that's 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 very important. At the end of this year, we're hoping to have that all drafted with member states. And next year, some of the Americas have governments take a look, approve a framework, first framework. And I think just because I'm a multilateral, I want to highlight the importance of that countries get together to understand each other that reality. And you mentioned it, Silvana. Europe, United States, Asia, all the parts of the globe, the geopolitics of AI is vivid. Countries are reaching out for it, and there is a lot of under, uh, not a lack of understanding in how to go about it. So I think that's what's important to find a way to create some of the guidelines that can um, address and, and, and be implemented in the countries and in the world. So, um, those commitments are going to be very important beyond what technically the countries are capable to do uh, right now. I leave it there. Thank you. For, for Thank me, you. The, the answer, and uh, I know we have limited time, so instead of going into a long <laughs> tirade, which I think is required on this topic, there's also a very simple answer and that's digital public infrastructures. You know, I think there's a Venn diagram where the two topics highlighted by the World Bank very correctly intersect. And I think that's going to be a very big discussion because you know, the last two years have been a time where, among other developments in AI, we start really understanding the concentrations of power. And, you know, we're we're facing a situation both in Europe, in the US and in other regions. I think we by now have charted pretty well challenges around sort of the previous phase of digital development basically around platforms. So actually, I am a bit surprised, for instance, in the European context, I thought by now we will see a lot more of this awareness that the challenges are the same. If we decide, define systemic risks uh, for the major social networks, it's kind of obvious you could apply this uh, category very prominent in Digital Services Act to AI. This hasn't been done. Um, so I'm not saying it's a simple solution, but that's where I would look for a space. We need, first of all, public alternatives to these commercial systems, but also, as always, deployment of public solutions creates room to set standards because they are usually more transparent. There are requirements to work in the open and things like that. Thank you.
That is really helpful. We have about five or six minutes left. So I, I, I know we could talk about AI for another few hours, uh, but I just want to get to an, another one of the elephants in the room to be able to close with this, um, which is that all of these topics bring up inevitable questions about how do you mitigate the risk of potential government overreach? And this could be anywhere from data privacy risks to surveillance and repression. So how should we approach digital government initiatives today if we don't have a crystal ball to know who might be in government tomorrow? I mean, I can kick us off because I know we're short on time and be incomplete here, but I mean, I just think maybe to go back to one thing I was saying, I th I think that there really does need to be an analysis of power concentration, um, you know, and, and to some extent that I, I think Alec was speaking to this a little bit about the, the regulatory space in Europe and the efforts that were made around platforms, you know, to address some of that. Um, but so there, the groundwork has been laid and, you know, we have some tools about um, gearing private sector innovation towards the public interest or towards contributing to human rights and democracy and rule of law. And I think figuring out, you know, which of those levers are really necessary to strengthen and how, um, in so, especially in some of the multilateral conversations that Mike is alluding to, is just absolutely critical, you know, so I... I think that there's that it's, but it's that emphasis on where is where is AI, you, you know, and um, the synthetic data that it creates, you know, where 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 do we really need to to address the predictable concentrations of power in places and for actors that are not already, um, you know. We don't already have the checks and balances to make sure that they act in the public interest. So I think I do think it comes back mm -hmm. to the concept of of the public interest and and incentivizing um, that all all of the innovation you know really spills over into supporting that and and, and you know sort of building these commons that we that we want to create. Yeah, if I can, please go ahead. This is a sort of both interesting and challenging question to answer from uh, for a person who lives in a state that suddenly went basically a shift from a country that I believe was not fully democratic to one that I think is now democratic and very quickly sort of pulling back some of the negative reforms, but it just shows some precarity. And I don't think there's a good answer. You know, there's one minimization answer. This is the often the digital rights approaches, just in case, let's not build these systems. I think I come from a perspective where that's too limiting. But honestly, then I think we need to depend on the rule of law uh, for good and bad. Honestly, these infrastructures will be deployed. We need to face scenarios uh, like any state infrastructure, you know, uh, based on sort of political power, this can change. I don't think this is an optimal answer. I know that often the alternative answer is also then that's the value of maybe civic projects, that they can be a bit more independent. But I think these projects are also often very precarious, don't scale very well, and so on. I think it's a lot about having a balancing act in this regard. No, no really simple answers. Mm -hmm. Alison, you were about to say Yeah, something. no, I was. I as much as I think the innovation is really important, I think some of the most, you know, some of it is basic tech. It doesn't always have to be AI and the flashiest things for people to get better delivery of public programs or public services or just experiencing their government, whether, you know, it's, we could, we could go down all the examples of where government could modernize a, a, across the board. But I think there's so much that's happening offline that we also don't talk to. Like Mike at the very beginning talked about procurement. Like procurement needs to be reformed across the board so that countries can really experiment and figure out what solutions could work for them before committing millions, billions, what, whatever it is to specific routes of administering you know, governments. And I think talking about procurement, policy, laws, you know, all of those things need to happen hand in hand. And I think 
at least what we see quite often is that people are like, well, I don't do tech. I don't get it. But I think that's almost like an, an ostrich approach. Like if you put your head in the sand and say like, well, I'm just going to talk about what's happening offline because I don't understand what's happening online. You're missing this opportunity um, to share all these perspectives. And I, and I keep coming back to the fact that procurement reform really does need all of these thinkers with all these different expertise. Um, so yeah, I, I could keep going, but I always leave it to, I'm like, let's look at like procurement for improving democracy because that isn't a conversation you hear too much. <laughs> Were there any more thoughts on that question before we close? Uh, so Lana, I just coming back to the first thing, it's not abstract, it's very practical. But it requires definitely that first step. I think definitely, again, just to highlight the importance of commitments and agreements that countries and authorities can look after. Uh, in the absence of that, it's going to be just a wide open road uh, that nobody can drive on it at, at, at the country level. And so I think that's what's very important. And I don't want to be uh, too challenging here, but there are convention against corruption around the world, right? And I, and, I, and I think that down the road, I believe we're going to need something similar, some similar instruments to follow up on governments in digital agenda. And I think just, again, because I'm a multilateral organization here, thinking about what is that countries can look at and what are the countries can be monitored on, are they following up on uh, ethics responsibility when implementing um, a digital government or at the point of digital transformation. And I think that's going to be very important to look at the future. So those agreements, those commitments actually tie the follow the, the, the next governments, uh, not the current government in place, uh, but will tie to the next ones. And I think that's also that's very important uh in order to follow up with them and have them to come up with a more of a line of work instead of a governmental line of work. I think that's going to be very important. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. So I hope that our discussion uh, gave us a bit to think about and hopefully a sense of optimism. We heard about a lot of interesting things that are happening in the field. Um, you know, President Biden has said in the past that democracy does not happen by accident. So I find it encouraging that there's a lot of thinking and work going on intentionally about what we need to be thinking about today and deciding today for the systems that we're shaping for tomorrow. So thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. I really appreciate it. And I, it sounds like we all have our work cut out for us, but we appreciate your time today.